kill Bone Crusher Giant earlier, and it was pretty good. Like, you know, two mana deal four to a creature is nothing to, to sneer at. You know, we played Lava Coil for a long time without it having the capability of uh, killing a Planeswalker, right? It, even when Planeswalkers were really powerful during War of the Spark era. Um, and this doesn't exile, but it still deals four to the creature, and that's a pretty huge deal for red. And the fact that it doubles as a Planeswalker removal is just upside, in my opinion. We are looking at some opening hands here. It's like Hicks is looking at a six, Singlis is on seven. But Hicks is on the play by virtue of being the third seed, a forest and a pass. Inglis kept the hand with two copies of Genesis Ultimatum, but three lands and some ramp here in the form of the Fertile Footsteps and an Uro off the top could help things too. Yeah, he got some time. Um, Los Cobra is not specifically great in this matchup uh, because uh, Inglis, uh, sorry, uh, Hicks actually has quite a number of two mana ways to kill it, or in, in even one mana ways to kill it with, uh, with Spike Field. Uh, but like Bone Crusher Giant specifically is a card that they are always looking for in the early turns to make sure that Cobra isn't a factor. So like mulganing a hand that's like kind of mediocre to try to find Lowe's Cobra is just not something that I'm interested in. Turn two draw for Hicks is huge. It's Lucky Clover, and in turn three, here we see Fertile Footsteps. So two lands entering untapped. Quick mana advantage for Hicks. We'll see how they're able to convert on that from here, but. We're going to see at least Heart's Desire for now, getting on the battlefield with two 1-1 one, one tokens, thanks to the Clover. What'd I say? <laughs> yeah, you were saying before we watched the match, the turn two Clover, that's really important for the Adventures deck to be able to win here. Yeah, I think um, the story here is just Lucky Clover on two. That was a, a really strong top deck. Allows now for the entire deck to be turbo-powered. And you're really seeing, again, why I was kind of comparing it to Bitter Blossom in the deck earlier. Uh, it just feels like draws with and draws without it are just night and day. And uh, and here you're just really seeing the strength of it because Fertile Footsteps off of Beanstalk Giant allows for untapped lands. And now turn two, Clover, turn three, Fertile Footsteps lets them go Love Strike Beast's Heart's Desire, as well as hold up Mystical Dispute in case there's some powerful three drop being played. Inglis answers with a Fertile Footsteps. No copy on that side of the table. So go back to Hicks. See an attack with those two tokens, English to 18. Another Lucky Clover was picked up. Not a lot to do with that just yet. So we're just going to see the Lovestruck Beast and Balagad Recovery played as the land. I don't love playing the Balagad Recovery there. On five mana, you're like doing okay. I like going Dispute on whatever the play is this turn, whether it's Omnath or Yoro or anything like that. And then untapping and going um, the Balagad Recovery to return the mystical dispute to allow for a mystical dispute on the follow-up turn so your your pressure actually comes through quite well here with the love stroke beast and the two tokens wow well, here is an all. adventure creature fate of wishes off the top and that land's kind of paying off here maybe not i we have seen hex do this sometimes where you see the granted cast just to get some counter spell to protect the table, at which point it makes sense to hold on to the Clover, and you're seeing that here. First copy of Granted grabs a Negate. We'll see what the other one wants to get. Could even just be the Dispute. Yeah, I don't hate the Dispute. You just want to try to win a Counter War. You want to put your opponent into a Pickle. You want them to have to uh, beat what you have on the battlefield and beat the Counter Spells in hand, and this is exactly how you're supposed to attack a ramp deck. You're supposed to put some pressure on it one way or another and then use some sort of interaction to stifle their development. And in this specific scenario, uh, we're going to be stifling uh, their payoffs, you know. And Dispute is the answer. Yeah, so just full-on counter spells here and attack for seven. Inglis had 11. Hicks has to be relatively happy with this position. Pretty solid top deck here for English, though. Kenrith Return King. That one can fight through Negate and Dispute. It can. It's not really that big of a deal, though, at the moment. I mean, the, the life totals are pretty heavily in favor of Riley. And um, I wouldn't be surprised to see... If Kenrith does come down this turn, which it looks like it probably will, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, a trade with the Lovestruck Beast. And that's like takes away a lot of the pressure the Hicks has. But at the same time, I think that's like just fine. So it looks like Kenrith is going to be cast, leaving up Dispute Mana. 
We go back to Riley Hicks. I am a bit interested. Uh, you seem fairly confident that we might see a trade with the Beast and the Kenrith. Maybe not. I think that it's kind of interesting. Inglis does only have one white mana, but gaining five a turn, that does kind of invalidate the Beast. And also Inglis maybe has some life to play with. So I'm kind of curious about this combat. I mean, it invalidates the Beast only so much that it makes you spend three mana every turn, and that is a lot. Um, but it might be worth keeping the Kenrith around for at least one more turn. And I think that maybe that's what Inglis is looking for. Yeah, that's the big thing. Inglis had at least a little bit of time. So the beast does connect. Inglis down to six. We see another heart's desire. Hicks battlefield going a little wide here. And that other love struck beast added to the table here. And only one blue mana here from Inglis. So no way to like play Uro and protect with Mystical Dispute. It's uh, but I mean, it's not like Mystical Dispute really does a ton at the moment anyway. They just pay three for the Uro. But right. I, think, I mean, obviously, Inglis is in a tough spot. You're facing off against two Love Shark Beasts. You're at six. You have a bunch of tokens out there, too. This seems like a pretty easy Alpha Strike from Inglis. And, um, you know, there's not going to be a, a anything really done other than just a like, gain five life from the Kenrith. Well, the Kenrith can pump itself, right? The green ability oh, can sure. put it up to a 6-6. Six, six. I mean, that's fair. But, like, uh, you're taking nine. I guess maybe you just don't attack this turn and you just keep going wide and more and more wide. Something I was wondering about when we saw Hicks on the double granted turn, I almost thought we might see one counterspell and Embercleave try to set that up. The two counterspells is pretty nice, but the one of Kenrith from Inglis's deck, this is potentially an issue. Yeah, the Embercleave might have been uh, a better long-term play. Uh, I think the, the deciding factor, though, was just not having the second red mana source for it. Obviously, this Triumph uh, unlocks it for next turn potentially but that was three turns ago that that decision was made gotcha you know? that, that that's a good point uh, I, I did kind of miss that there was only one red mana here all right so an alpha strike would send for nine uh, uh after the life gain and the pump effect from the kinner they'd be down to two i bet what happens here is i see i was kind of assuming that we'd have a um Fae of Wishes come down to try to just keep pressuring the life total, but I think what might actually end up happening is just Fae of Wishes gets returned to hand at some point in, in over the next turn cycle, and then that tutors for something that wins the game. Um, I would have maybe enjoyed playing the Ketra Tree on this turn, that way, and just discard whatever counterspell you don't play and the other extra lucky Clover for the Fae of Wishes. That way you have the second red mana for the Ember Cleave. So Fae well, of Wishes added to the battlefield there. Small chance the game ends next turn, and not in the way you might think. Kenrith doing some work, drawing a card, gaining some life. Omnath and Terror of the Peaks added to the hand. Terror a one of in English configuration here. I do like playing Mystical Dispute right now in main decks if you're going to be trying to fight this four-color ramp deck. You know, Omnath, Uro, Genesis Ultimatum, all being the payoffs. You know, I, I'm a fan of snapping Mystical Dispute on any card early, like Ramp or Effect or Threat or whatever, it doesn't matter, because it gets so much worse as the game progresses. Yeah, that makes sense. And it gets a pretty wide battlefield and two known counter spells. It's like Inglis is interested in just kind of resting on the Kenrith for now. Keep gaining five life a turn, draw some extra cards until the hand can really punch through those counter spells or the battlefield in some meaningful way. See a cycle of the Triumph for Hicks. Finds another red source in that Crag Crown pathway. One thing I might have liked to have seen uh, the Alpha Strike previous turn. Obviously, you lose a Love Truck Beast, but I don't think the bodies are gonna matter like ever. Like you're, you're gonna win or lose by like a mile, um, or sorry, you're gonna lose by a mile, and you may win by inches. So an Alpha Strike last turn would have left Inglis at two, like untapping at two life, 
against Love Shrug Beast, four tokens, and a Fey of Wishes. And then this turn, they'd be pumping to seven and taking five from all the one power creatures, but they're still just like basically required to continue uh, activating the Kinrith to gain life. And that might have opened up an avenue for the Fey of Wishes instead of the cycle last turn on the Triome, maybe go Fey of Wishes, discard, tutor next turn out from the sideboard to potentially kill them. Yeah, I think that after seeing how the last turn played out, the wheels were turning for Hex. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I made my I didn't make my attack, my opponent gained life and just drew a card. Right, exactly. If they're just drawing extra cards and going up life, this position isn't really getting better. Especially if you're just kind of sitting on counter spells every turn. It's kind right. of a staring contest right now, and so you just want to pressure your life total. Even attacking with like the four one one tokens makes more sense than attacking with nothing i think because you like i would gladly trade a token to like deal three to my opponent in that spot like it's not like having all the bodies is going to come up in any relevant standpoints very soon you know mm -hmm. this is pretty interesting it looks like hicks is looking at picking up Fey of Wishes on their own turn. I thought we might see this activation. I didn't think we would see it at sorcery speed. It's possible they're just doing it now because that makes it harder for Inglis to kill it in any way before it gets returned and gain the life off the Kenrith. So if you do have the removal spell, it's like, okay, well, pick your poison. But also they can just double tutor and still hold up Dispute, right? Because they just have five mana. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a, another big point. Yeah, that would still tag an ultimatum here. Mm -hmm. I think what's going to end up happening, though, is Hicks's Fave Wish is probably going to get countered by this Mystical Dispute uh, when it goes for granted here. And they, they still get one, but it might need a two to, to close it out, you know? So, first granted resolves. Take another look at that sideboard. Cool spread of options here. You can see it on your screen. You can also read it on Cardboard Live. Primal Might added to the hand. We'll see if the second granted resolves. The second granted is an interesting one to tag. It makes it so that the first one might have been uh, taken incorrectly, like a, well, under the assumption that the first one resolves, you know? As yeah. Under the assumption that the second one resolves, the first one gets Primal Might, and now there's like there's no Ember Cleave, so maybe the Primal Might is just actually bad. Right. Yeah. To the extent that uh, there's different considerations, if your if your two card package isn't just one card plus a second card, if it's actually two cards meant to play well together, letting the first copy resolve could be a big moment for Inglis. So second granted the copy. I guess this is the actual Fae of Wishes. That's that's the other thing about it, mm -hmm. is that this is the one that comes with a 1-4. That, that, I imagine, is a little bit less of a consideration here. We're going to see players take some timeouts. As this turn likely dictates the rest of the game, there is the dispute. That's going to leave Inglis with enough mana to uh, pump up the Kenrith. Interest. Oh, oh my. Are, are we going to have a big, hasty, lethal turn? I don't know. Inglis there's might no, have been... No lands. I think, yeah, I think that was a hedge. Inglis was hoping to draw one of the fetch lands, like a Fabled Passage right. there. Then you could go off with Omnath. Exactly. And I think the Mystical Dispute, only having one blue mana, all these things maybe combined. Like, the fact that there's no land sitting on Inglis's hand right now to be able to trigger the Omnath or the Lotus Cobra means in order to get the land, they need to cast Uro. And that is probably going to get tagged by Mystical Dispute to just soak all the mana for the turn, which in turn makes Kenrith not be able to be activated. And yeah, we're seeing it just, like, not come through. And there's, there's no current lethal attack. You know, unless the Primal Might connects for full value on the Love Struck Beast. And I mean, and that's a bold, like with so many cards in the opponent's hand, that is a bold ask to, to just go for it, you know? And now this is interesting. Hicks untapping. 
down to just one love struck beast four tokens otherwise inglis at one though there's an activation for five life at the ready and i don't know if the sit spot gets better what you're saying makes sense you know the threat of yeah, some interactions on it. this is a bad thing but yeah this might be hicks only shot at it i mean it's gonna work either the kindred dies from uh, a trait if he puts three counters on it um and makes 11 versus an 11 but then like you just die to the tokens because you're at one so or, or you gain some life and you still die because everything in your hand sorcery speed so it's gonna work this works the game is over for riley hicks here yeah primal might for the full amount you can make the fight good or you can gain some life and you can't do both and only one is not good enough riley hicks some good navigation there with some Fae of Wishes shenanigans, picks up at the first game over David Inglis. Yeah, I mean, impressive stuff. They put him on the back foot early. The, there was a lot of dancing with Kenrith there, but the the long and short of it is a turn two Clover, turn three Fertile Footsteps into uh, Heart's Desire, followed by another Love's, Love, uh, Love Struck Beast and Heart's Desire, was enough pressure to make it in con conjunction with the two counter spells that were found to basically bottleneck the four color ramp deck the entirety of the game. They sat on Kinrith for roughly four turns and all they did was gain life and pump it. And it was just not close. To, I mean, it was close to enough, like w given a little more mana somewhere in there, like a couple of lands drawn instead of just more seven drops or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a chance Inglis could have gone back in that game, but the story of the game is the turn two clover, turn three fertile footsteps. Picks, no need to sideboard. That's all Fae of Wishes stuff. Inglis gonna try to figure out the package. A lot of options. Four colors gives you a lot of custom uh, customization potential. You can order your own Zendikar Rising cards on StarCityGames.com slash ZNR. I got a freebie for you, Ryan. Hit me. Maybe maybe wait like three days if you're gonna buy <laughs> if you're gonna no specifically for Omnath just wait three days before you put in your pre I, actually I think I'm not positive but I know at some point I thought there was a a like if your card gets banned protection I just thing. wouldn't if you don't know for sure that's not the that's kind true. of thing you should say oh uh, you right you right yeah just wait just wait three days just wait three days yeah um. We'll, we'll see what, what comes on Monday, but uh, can't imagine that it'd be very sustainable to see a lot of tournaments like this. Tell you what, this is like a once in a lifetime thing where you see one deck completely dominate a tournament here. Just, um, just a, uh, it's just unlucky. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it'll be different tomorrow. Yeah, we'll tomorrow, have... I mean, we'll have the counter to the four color ramp deck tomorrow. Yeah. And that deck will very easily win the whole tournament. I, I was going to take the, we'll see eight copies of Four Color Ramp in the top eight tomorrow. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> we're just going to cut to top 16. <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to cut to the lowest place where a different deck might win the tournament. That's fair. <laughs> we're underway here. Players with some land drops. No innkeepers, no clovers early on for Hicks here. Just some lands for both players. Bunch of triomes for Inglis. Ketria triome in a forest starts things off for Hicks. Thinking about an end step stomp. Yeah, whatever. Go upstairs. Make your turn <laughs> yeah, no, easy. Yeah. No, uh, no Cobra. All right, we're gonna put some pressure on you, and that, I like it. I really like it. Let's play this Bone Crusher Giant. Let's get to work attacking that life total. Love it. And step, you're going to see Wilt cycled. I think I've seen Wilt in about five different games here for Always a cycled. ramp player. Yeah, cycled literally every time. Yeah, I mean, then I have the Clover on two. It's the same way with like Stomp to Face, Untap, Play Bone Crusher Giant. You just cycle Wilt because they didn't play the thing that it kills. Mm -hmm. The answer is having effective cycling or just alternate modal uses um, makes interacting like uh, much easier. Well, the Bone Crusher Giant thing, there, there's some tones there where, like, if Lotus Cobra is showing up later, it's a lot less impactful. And it's true that you're slower going with the Clover. I mean, it's it's a lot, like, killing it is not really going to do a lot if yeah, you don't uh, immediately yeah. make the land drops. It's kind of the thing. 
Whereas, like, killing a clover always seems like it would be in play for me, so it's really amusing to me that we always see Wilt cycled. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool that Wilt exists, though. Like, I, I mean, I love me a naturalize. I've, I've sideboarded a naturalize so often in, in decks, and, like, the worst thing in the world is to, like, draw naturalize in your straightforward, you know, aggro deck or whatever. And then your opponent just like never plays the thing that you're that you want to naturalize for, and so you lose because you didn't have a grizzly bears instead. <laughs> Bone Crusher Giant goes to work. A lot of lands in the hand of Hicks here. A couple of them are triomes, but it does take a relevant amount of mana to cycle those. Back over to Inglis. Fertile Footsteps picked up, the Beanstalk Giant. A lot of seven mana spells in this four color ramp deck. Yeah, Genesis Ultimatum is the one that's hard seven. At least uh, Fertile Footsteps really cost three. I mean, I, I've seen Fertile Footsteps cast, you know, dozens and dozens of times. I, I don't know that I've seen Bone Crusher Giant. Uh, or not Bone Crusher, uh, sorry. Um, Beanstalk Giant. Beanstalk Giant cast more than five times yeah <laughs> here is fertile footsteps get a look at those big toesies i know that was a callback to earlier yeah it's gonna let it, i'm just gonna let it go because i'm why would, you, why would you let it go because uh you're killing me with this dead air just <laughs> Okay, give me, fine. Here give me, is. give me, Here give me a little laugh. Right, you know? the it's uh, Mr. Tozies. Yeah, you know? there it is. Thank, look, thank you. Look, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how much I'm uh, allowed to say, because I, I, you know, I don't know where the line is usually for me. All right, all right. I'm Sorry, gonna, I'm gonna, I know, I'm I know where you, my line. I'm gonna is. offer you. I'm gonna <laughs> offer you uh, a lesson here. Okay. From me to you, it's free to just laugh at my joke, man. You don't gotta say anything. Oh, that's fair. But my whole thing is taking everything said at face value. That's my joke. Oh, I thought you were going to say too far. That also. <laughs> extremely too far also is my other thing. <laughs> About a five mana mystical to speed. Is that good enough? It's Maybe. been pretty good when we've yeah. seen it. Yeah, Bone yeah. Crusher Giant rumbling across. So this is what Hicks has been setting up. I have a creature. I have some number of threats. And I'm going to put this mystical dispute face up. But even though you know about it, your Genesis Ultimatum still costs seven mana. True that. It has looked pretty dang good. Mm -hmm. Beanstalk Giant, though, can't dispute that one. And Bone Crusher is a little bit smaller. You know, when um, when Eldrain first came out, they, they made Mystical Dispute. And uh, it was like week, week one, uh, I played in some tournament that I was invited to. I forgot what it was called. And I, I built a mono blue deck. Uh, and I played my match against Seth Manfield. And at some point, he was playing five color Golos. He just cast nothing and killed me with Feel the Dead. <laughs> and I died with six counter spells in hand. And it made me the most angry I have ever been in my entire life. <laughs> uh, specifically because counter spells are supposed to be a natural foil to ramp decks. And you're seeing it here. You're seeing Mystical Dispute, a one mana counter spell. Keep a seven mana counter spell and, or seven mana game winner of Genesis Ultimatum in check. And you can play around it. That's, I mean, that's the dance of playing against counter spells. You have to play around things as much as you can. So we're seeing, you know, Beanstalk Giant be cast here instead of Genesis Ultimatum. But then next turn, we're, we have Inglis uh, playing around Mystical Speed again, and he has to try to find a way to leverage his mana in a way that doesn't falter against Mystical Dispute. So you mentioned being the most angry you've ever been. I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal something that drives me to irrational rage. Okay. I'll All right. Uh, if you could give Beanstalk Giant any keyword. Trample. What? Todd. Sorry. Reach. Um, Beanstalk Giant literally is a top. A, it's a giant monster, right? The Beanstalks go into clouds and fairy tall fairy tales. Beanstalk Giant does not have Reach, and Robber of the Rich does. They're in the same set. It's a okay, disaster. Yeah. It's a disaster. I can, I can explain it. I can explain it very easily. I don't you want can... it explained. I want to be mad. 
Okay, you can be mad all you want to, Ryan. Have you ever had a, uh, like a, not like a, a house fly, because that one's kind of easy, but have you ever had a gnat fly around your face? Yeah. And even though that you are, you are enormous compared to the gnat, they could fly over your head? The argument here is that or, Robert of the Rich would hit a gnat with a crossbow. Uh, you're, can I, you're losing. Can I finish? Can no. I finish? Okay. Being a sock giant attacking for nine. Okay. It's an aggressive attack. The giant's just getting busy. Love it. You know, swag on him. Backup ultimatum after the first one's copied. I, I guess Inglis is feeling pretty good about that one. All right, can I finish? No, man. No, okay. I'm, I'm venting about some stuff that doesn't make sense and is very stupid. <laughs> and you're trying to explain it. I don't want it explained. Oh, when you, when you tell your life? story and you're oh. mad, I didn't tell you, Todd, your deck sucked and obviously Seth is better than you. I didn't say that. I said, no, but oh, you thought it and well, you just yeah, said it now. now. You did say it. OK, so now I have full range to just finish my story. <laughs> We've gone full circle. <laughs> Granted time. Got you know how it's really hard to kill a gnat? <laughs> <laughs> you know how it's like really hard, right? Like uh, gnat, Gnats I thought were pretty easy. Flies are really hard, though. Okay, let's say a fly. It's, it's pretty hard to kill a fly. Most of the time you just let it go, right? You just wave your hand and it goes away. Yeah. And I, I would not consider a human to have reach against this fly because the fly can just go get away. They can they can literally fly away. And to a beanstalk giant, let's say like a, there's a human in a flying machine, and let's say this giant is the size of what I think it is. If it's a twenty twenty or ten ten or whatever, it is the size of a mountain. Do you really think like a mountain would care about like a little thing that's just kind of nearby it, like a fly? The answer is probably no, unless the thing starts stinging it or biting it. In that case, you're within arm's reach, and then that's just how combat works, right? It's just combat. There's a non-trivial amount of large green creatures that have reach because they're large, though. <sighs> that's true. That's true. Like, a lot of tree people, uh, tree folks. Yeah. No, you're right. I I'll just give it to you because of the toesies stuff. Uh, yeah. There you give go. me. A you're right. <laughs> thank, thank you. Granted for Tormod's crypt from Hicks, I was wondering if the negate was going to pop into the hand. But maybe uh, an issue about just not being able to hold up enough mana, perhaps. But maybe the, maybe not. Something to uh, block for that Uro in the graveyard. But this Genesis ultimatum in the hand, I think that just became a problem. Yeah, no counterspell for it here. This Genesis Ultimatum is just, you know, the first one got hit with a Mystical Dispute, but that was like an intentional uh, way to basically fight through the dispute by just going back-to-back -back turns of casting the Genesis Ultimatum. No answer here. Thormas Crypt's going to eat the Uro, but it's not going to do anything to the Genesis Ultimatum itself. Indeed. Graveyard gone, but we're, we're concerned about the top five cards of the deck. Are they any good Tell me about him, Ryan. When, I mean, it's, whenever you see him. At, at some point, I will know what's supposed to thing. not take so long. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, Probably a permanent that is considered oh, being, baby. being considered to go to hand. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> Terror of the Peaks, Uro, Lotus Cobra. Yikes. <clears throat> yeah, that's a lot of damage. Let, let's pack it up. That Beanstalk Giant, also lethal here. That's an 11-11. Heard about this? It's not bad. I love the just negate backup now. <laughs> you just also yeah. have. Negate. I love the Genesis Ultimatum. Like some cards, like Genesis Ultimatum, have the caveat that if you miss on the permanence or whatever, they're just gone. They're exiled, or they go to the bottom of the deck, or just something like that. Genesis Ultimatum, they just like go to hand, and that seems somewhat trivial until you start playing it in like a Simic deck or whatever, and then you realize that oh, drawing cards are, is just extremely good, and that's all I ever want to do. Hmm. Yeah, when well, we're playing these decks where Genesis Ultimatum resolves, but we're playing on yeah. <laughs> those cards in hand, they matter. 
I mean, okay. sometimes, like, that, that is the case. I mean, technically, we are playing on. The game is mostly over, but if there were a chance to get out of it, say, the mirror, and I also had a Genesis Ultimatum or something like that, that negate would probably be the nail in the coffin. Right, exactly. Right, Beanstalk Giant, but it's just just a, a, a mere 10-10 to combat English is 12-12. Also, I don't know if you knew this, Todd, but it doesn't have reach, which means the Terror of the Peaks can fly over that. Fate of Wishes does get to chump block that one, though. Yeah. I think I'm, the unfortunate thing here is that um, the game is over. That That is bad news for Riley Hicks, but uh, they are up one. English is looking to tie the score on games. The Attack of the Lotus Cover is kind of cool because if the Terror of the Peaks connects, um, a, there are a couple things uh, that just end the game from hand. Like four, uh, like any creature that has at least four power just wins via Terror of the Peaks. Uh, because if the Fae of Wishes blocked the Cobra over the Terror, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of like the Cobra attack. Inglis hangs it back, though. We see the giant eat the other giant. Terror bobs uh, Hicks down to four. Even um, with a Cobra on Fae of Wishes block, a second Cobra coming down would finish off the Fae of Wishes. So I, I did I do like attacking with the Cobra. Now not not doing so. It's not going to end up changing anything, but uh, but it could have. Love struck beast off the top. That that one's looking a little uh, little too little. It's not often Love Shark Beast gets called little, you know? You ever um you ever seen like Shaq next to Yao Ming? <laughs> and you think like, holy crap, Shaq is a an enormous human. But then you see him standing next to Yao Ming and there's like a foot difference in height or whatever. Mm. Maybe it's not a foot, it's like six inches or whatever. It's outrageous. I see I see what you're I see what you're going. That's that's Love Shark Beast compared to Beanstalk Giant. <laughs> You know, they're not used to getting Shaq is not used to being called short stuff. And Yao Ming says, hey, short stuff. <laughs> Catch me a triumph cycle. Finds Brazen Borrower. I mean, I don't know. Is, is Petty Theft anything here? Doesn't seem like um, enough. Not I mean, not with Negate sitting, right? Like Negate just means that none of these decisions really matter. Well, at least we get to watch it for a while. Yeah. No, there's posturing, there's thinking, there's <laughs> potential out. Look, if this were real life, I would just say, hello, opponent, here's my... You know I have this negate. I've already shown it to you. <laughs> you know? If it was magic online, I'd be saying it in the chat. Yeah, GG's. I don't say GG's in real life until my... I, I don't say GG ever unless my opponent says GG first. Yep. That's my go-to. Yep. I say if the if the match ends and I win and there was no GG said, I say good luck next round. Yeah, I say uh, enjoy your drive home. Uh, David yeah. English is going to tie things up here. We're going you to game stupid <laughs> non four color ramper. <sighs> English is going to revisit the cyborg. Riley Hicks conserving valuable mental energy no interest in cyborging in any matchup but just i still love that oh yeah i mean fae of wishes karn the great creator burning wish cunning wish these are all uh things that i like to use as my sideboard instead of having to think about sideboarding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. here's my sideboard guide uh don't oh yeah that's a pretty interesting strategy <laughs> having no strategy at all <laughs> two good seven card hands here got a yeah, temple and mystery on one for hicks and inglis uh set up here i like that um so one side has like cobra and spikefield hazard and the other has like no real targets for Spikefield Hazard other than back half of Brazen Borrower. Um, so like the, I I don't know, man. The Bone Crusher Giants just being better than the opponent Spikefield Hazard is kind of cool. Uh, Edge Wall like, Innkeeper is a big interaction. Oh yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Excuse me on that one. 
Um, but like in in this hand versus hand analysis, you know, we have a bunch of ramp, a little bit of interaction, and some lands. And on the other side, we have some ramp, a little bit of interaction, and some lands. And the difference here is Inglis actually has that Felidar Retreat as payoff. And it'll be interesting to see if on the important turn, uh, Hicks holds up the negate for the Felidar Retreat. I'm really interested in what's about to happen here because Inglis is on the tank about whether to play turn two Lotus Cobra. And yeah, no thank you. I read you for that stomp. Here's my second triome. Well, he also played a land that made it so he can't really play a turn three Cobra either, which is weird because he can't go force into land, play another spell, you know, off the trigger. Mm -hmm. But I, I like the setup. I like not putting yourself in a vulnerable position. I like, you know, earlier opponents showcased that they are more than willing to go stomp face, untap bone crusher giant. And here, if he had played his tapped triome faster, I think that, Riley would have 100% gone stomp into Bone Crusher Giant. But the fact that he tanked for so long and didn't do it, Inglis actually just, uh, or Riley just kind of sniffed it out and he's just like, okay, well, I'm just not going to do that. It's not going to bother. Yeah, no stomp. We're going to see fertile footsteps on Hicks' turn. Go find a mountain and go back to David Inglis. Kenrith off the top. You mentioned that there's no good way to take advantage of Lotus Cobra on this turn. Nothing really to cast anyway. Probably just Uro here. Yeah, Uro, play land. The next turn you can go Feldar Retreat, land, and make a 2-2. And if you uh, play the Trium, you can actually have that red source be Mountain and still cast Spikefield Hazard as well. So maybe you can go like block with the Feldar Guardian in, on the Bone Crusher Giant and then uh, use Spikefield Hazard to trade up with it. Trium put in. Inglis set up really nicely. Couple Haymakers, some lands to back him up. Hicks is going to play. Trium tapped. Another Haymaker off the top. Well, Haymaker-esque Escapes the Wild. It's a pretty solid card. I do feel weird calling that one Haymaker-esque, but it's just uh, in relation to so many other high-impact spells in the deck. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I would say the Escape the Wild is... I mean, it's a Haymaker when you're, like, low on resources. When you're high on resources, it kind of feels just like playing Urban Evolution, you know? Like a draw three, play an extra land. Mm-hmm. And um, and I, I wouldn't consider Urban Evolution to be a haymaker. I, I would I would consider it to be a powerful spell, and certainly a welcome top deck when you're dry. But when right. you're flush, when you're flush, like it's just not necessary. And in this scenario, I think it's it's just like I would rather cast every other card in my hand before I cast Escape to the Wilds because not only do I have lands to play, but I have important good spells to play. Right. So here's Lotus Cobra. It's going to make an extra mana. There's Feldar Retreat. That one gets hit by Negate, and there's mana left over for Stomp. All right, here's what I would do next turn. I'm slamming both copies of Bone Crusher Giant, one from Adventure and one from Hand. Stomp is starting to lose its luster. I want to get as much pressure on the table as I can, and I want this, this uh, freaking Brazen Bar bounce to do something, you know? Yep, I love it, and Riley Hicks is into it. There's the two Bone Crushers. See what David Inglis can do to answer. Got a Kenrith and two Escapes of the Wilds in hand now. A Spike Field Hazard that's probably a tapped red land and an island otherwise. Here's the first escape. We have a Terror, three lands, and a Negate. So there's Island Fabled Passage, so the negate being left up. Yeah, luckily the... it just doesn't do anything for, for Riley. He can just play a freaking Beanstalk Giant here and go to work. Right. Speaking Ooh. of going to work, Bone what? Crushers rumble across. There's eight points. Oh yeah, tap land over path land. Uh, pathway, that means that the Beanstalk Giant's not castable. Leaving up Borrower. That has to be a mistake, right? Julius like played the wrong land, maybe. maybe. Are you just trying? Are they? Are you trying to bluff a counter spell? Like, Could be bluffing a, a counter spell. Like, I don't know. They I think it, it's rotting. It's revolving around like what you want to do when Terror of the Peaks shows up. But yeah, negate is just in hand, so you can't really get the petty theft off. Hmm. I'm not going to call a mistake because this could just be a judgment call of 
wanting to bluff, wanting to use Brazen Bar, wanting to put a flash flying threat onto the battlefield, wanting to protect herself from Omnath triple trigger, you know. I don't know, but I feel like it was a very, for me, it was a very easy 7-7, seven, seven, you know. So I was kind of blown away. Temple's going to scry Innkeeper to top. I mean, I think if you're keeping Innkeeper there, that, I mean, one thing I was thinking is in some spots, maybe you want the scry into something very specific, but I just don't think it's that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So back over to David Inglis. How can Tangrams capitalize here? Got a Terror of the Peaks on Layaway. That one's hanging out till the end of the turn. Yeah, not a whole lot to do with it this turn, though. If you cast ta uh, Terror, it's going to consume basically your whole turn. You can cast Spike Field, whatever. Maybe that's it. Maybe it was just a bait. You know, let them play Terror. Let them cast like a Uro from hand or something. And then in response to the Uro on the stack, you bounce a Terror and it kind of invalidates their whole turn. But now, like, what do you do? You, you have to wait for the negate to go away. And that means you can't even cast Beanstalk Giant this turn either. Well, I just, I just feel like you just missed a huge opportunity to put pressure on your opponent. Maybe Hicks was just fine trading Bone Crusher for Terror. I think you do end up with the mana just not used, which I think is the, the cost you're alluding to. That, that's kind of the big issue. The Beanstalk Giant could be attacking here, too. For now, though, we're just looking at the Bone Crushers rumbling across. Inglis, thinking about whether to offer a trade, decides not to. So it's going to be eight upstairs. Inglis to seven. So this might be an innkeeper land go. And then in response to the first creature that is cast uh, on Terror of the Peaks, you just use the Brazen Bar to go count to bounce it. And then that kind of takes some takes the wind out of their sails, you know. And then, uh, but I guess if you go main phase bounce, you play edge wall and keeper, you play brazen bar, you might actually find another counter spell to hold up. If you do all this kind of at main phase speed, um, you know, you actually can just have more information how to sequence and stuff. But maybe you just play edge wall and wait. So there was petty theft. This is on Hicks' turn. Bounces the terror. Plays the innkeeper. Gonna go to pass turn. Inglis is gonna use that removal spell on the innkeeper here. Spike field hazard. Hicks responds with borrower. Wants to get that card off the innkeeper. Finds another borrower. Can't cast either side just yet, but that could be a big deal in future combat with Inglis on seven. Right. And now you gotta wonder, maybe they should have actually killed the brazen bar. It's representing a lot of damage coming through. Um, and the Edgewall and Keeper just means uh, another few cards, but I don't think like raw card advantage matters in the spot. You just need to leverage your life total and board presence here. And um, the bar seems like a bit more of a threat than the uh, than the one drop one one uh, in Edgewall and Keeper. This is a kind of tough turn for Inglis, as you see Fabled Passage cracked. That represents mana source number eight. Land is man number mana number nine, but there's just three five mana spells in hand. Yeah, but Terror of the Peaks into uh, bring Uro back from the graveyard should just all but wrap this game up, honestly. Ah, this is I gonna missed gain that the uh, Passage turned that on. Yeah, the, the it was Passage plus the um, uh, the Gutshot card. I've said this name like seven Spike Field Hazard. Spike Field Hazard, sorry. Yeah, that's a big deal. Suddenly, this giant and this bar were not looking so hot. Hicks yeah. would uh, maybe like to control a Beanstalk Giant here. Would have liked to have had 7-7 seven, seven in play for the last three turns, but who am I? <laughs> Just a man. Brazen Borrower, Pathway in hand, facing down Terror of the Peaks and Uro. I mean, to be 100% clear and honest, I misclick playing the wrong land all the time. And if that is a, a case of what happened, then then that that's a feels bad man for for David Inglis for or for Riley Hicks for real. Yeah, no so kidding. I'm not, I'm not I'm not trying to say that you know it was a a huge error judgment. It might have just been misclick. Misclicks happen all the time. They have yeah, to I mean, be more misclick, than misclick, miscount. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, These things do mistakes. just happen. Yeah. 
There is a Petty Theft on Uro. Hicks is kind of hoping for a block on this Bone Crusher Giant, but no, su no such luck. Beanstalk Giant comes down now. We go back over to David Inglis, untapping with Terror of the Peaks. Untapping with Terror of the Peaks, having Omnath in hand. I think he can actually go Omnath, Riverglade Pathway, escape the wilds, play an extra land, and that and then triggers Omnath. As long as there's a land in the top five, that's a fine play. Might be better to just go Omnath, land Fertile Footsteps off the Beanstalk Giant, and then hit a land guaranteed to trigger the four mana. Then you can cast Escape to Wild or Kenrith and give everything haste, and there's a million different... It's stupid. It's just stu so stupid. <laughs> Gonna be a couple game actions taken here. That's what I'm I think hearing. The, I think the game's ending. Like, I think David Inglis actually just has lethal in if, like, one thing goes right. Because Terror of the Peaks can, for some reason, just hit the face. I don't get it. You know, I'm not... I didn't make these cards. I don't understand them though. <laughs> I don't. I don't mind Terror of the Peaks being go oh being God. able to go upstairs. Oh, that's fine. I just meant in general, all of it. Yeah, the, the the sum of everything going on here, kind of a mess. All right, so here's Omnath. That's actually gonna take a shot at the Beanstalk Giant. Follows up with Lotus Cobra. Couple points going upstairs. Now we see a land drop. Yeah, so then here is Fertile Footsteps. Footsteps triggers the Omnath to make the mana, and then you can use that to play Kinrith, minus one. And then you use uh, Red Source to give them all haste. This allows you... You can actually go Kinrith, Tear the Peaks targets Beanstalk Giant, and then you can use Kinrith and put a plus one, plus one counter on itself. And that actually... Oh, it's already five toughness. Never mind. If it had six toughness, I was say that. Okay, never mind. Yeah, Kinrith cuts about. down the Beanstalk Giant. Here's a row. Six points upstairs. Kenrith is just itching to give with a squad haste. Great. David Inglis is uh, eliminating our lone non-four color ramp player in our top eight today. For Riley Hicks, it was a good run. Team Rare Adventures deck looked pretty sweet. A lot of good lines as we covered them today, but this is where it comes to an end as David Inglis advances to the top four of our final championship qualifier here in season number two.